We live in a narrative that people seem to always be in a rush. Everywhere we look, speed of execution gets top billing. How fast will dinner be ready? How long will it take? When will we arrive? Are we there yet? When will I retire? When am I getting out of here? Where or where am I going on vacation? And what will I do next? These are looming questions that plague all of our lives at some point of our departure. Hasty moves can prove to be detrimental to our overall longevity and productivity. Moving faster than when God has not given provisions for such moves is a significant thought for us to consider. One thing, my brothers and sisters, we all must accept, and here it is. Our timing is not God's timing. The Lord reminds us in his word in Isaiah 55 and 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither my ways are your ways, saith the Lord. In other words, God says you and him cannot possibly think on the same wavelength. God has this remarkable way of navigating the circumstances of our lives to fulfill his prophecy concerning where you are today. Do not think when your mama met your daddy and you was conceived that you were by accident. God knew you before your parents knew themselves and before their parents even knew them. In other words, there is nothing that goes on in our lives that God is not aware of. No matter where you find yourself at today, God knows exactly where you are. You and I are the recipients of God's plans before time was created and time was even measured. Before a thought of a thought of a thought of you and I ever crossed the thought of somebody's mind, God had already picked the time that you were going to be born. Everything that is created was spoken into existence by the power of God. That's why it is hard for us to fathom the ways of God because we cannot even accept that everything that is that shall ever be was spoken in the mouth, in the mind, and then the means of God's power because God has the power to create just with his words. For you Bible readers who have read Genesis, it says God began the beginning before the beginning began and God did what he needed to do without having any substances to pull from. In other words, when God said, let there be light, light had to show up. Why? Because God is light himself. When God said, let the earth and the solar systems and everything fall in place, when God said that, everything that was not had to move because when God speaks with authority and a power, something is bound to happen. Here is, here is where we are. God is more significant than we can phantom, wiser than we can imagine, and more potent than our finite abilities. Here is the tension that I want you to look at within your own life. Can we get of God, can we get ahead of God's plans and move too fast with our decisions? The Matthean narrative surrounding the birth of Christ is filled with suspense, drama, and revelation. We all like things done in the order that we plan for things to go. No one likes their master plan to be disrupted. People get rubbed the wrong way when stuff doesn't work out like they thought it would. These private inside peeks into the personal lives of this man and his fiance has been given eternal exposure long before social media platforms were ever launched. 
Bully tactics become live wires waiting to erupt into flames of heated anger when people have to make uncalculated changes to their personal plans. However, God's word will not return to him void when God has spoken a thing to come to pass. Look at the text. Joseph is engaged to Mary. He's trying to live right in the eyesight of God and his fellow man. He and Mary ain't shacking. He is preparing himself to become a good husband. Joseph is much older than Mary. The Eastern Orthodox Church holds that Joseph's first wife, Siloam, was deceased, and now he is a widower when he is betrothed to Mary. Historicity teaches us that Joseph had at least six children before he met Mary. By previous marriage, there was his sons Judas, Justice, James, Simon, and two daughters, Asia and Lydia. Some Bible history scholars argue that Joseph was in his 50s, and some even suggest that he was 90 years old when he was engaged to Mary and died when he was 111. These two people are in a relationship. We have no record of parental consent for Mary's parents. Some Jewish customs allowed a young girl to get married as young as 12 years old. However, New Testament scholars suggest that Jesus was, only, was the only child of Mary and Joseph when he was found in the temple at 12 years old. Now, here is the tight spot that has already made you uncomfortable. You said, Pastor, how did you find all that information when it's not given in the biblical text? It's called extra biblical scholarship. Because John told you over in the last chapter, there was so much that went on with Jesus that they didn't have room enough to share all of the details. Check the text. I'm still in the Bible. Here, here, is, here is the rub. Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant. Here is what Joseph is wondering. What will I do about this? Can you imagine the frustration and aggravation for brother Joseph? He knows the customs. Either bring her before the public square and they stone her for breaking the vow or hide her to protect his reputation and hers from others. His mind is racing with thoughts and doubts and concern, worry, anxiety, uncertainty engulfs his heart. Joseph wants to do the right thing, but Joseph doesn't want any scandals out in these Bethlehem streets. Joseph wants to protect Mary from salon gossip. People will think he took advantage of Mary before they got married. Can't you hear the noise in the streets talking about Brother Joe? He's a dirty old man. He ought to be shame of himself. He has no self-control. You mean to tell me he couldn't wait a little longer before they got married? He's just wrong in our vernacular on so many levels. Before you get a whole lot of sympathy for Brother Joseph, can you imagine the fear and the concern wrestling within Mary? In chapter 1 of the Lucian narrative, the angel of the Lord talks directly to Mary using these words in his opening statement, fear not. The dialogue between the angel of the Lord and Mary deserves some investigation. Mary has all the rights in the world to question why. It's her body, it's her life, and it ought to be her choice. Yet, Mary is not afraid to ask the difficult questions of how in the world did I get pregnant without having any relations. Mary had her own plans, but God interrupted her plans. She didn't plan for all this to happen in her life at this age. She is pregnant, but has not been with any man, especially the man that she's been engaged to. She is carrying something that's way more significant than she ever imagined. Her body has been taken over by divinity and her humanity. You don't want to talk to me, but you, it is in here. He, uh, she knows the, com- the custom. She's trying to calculate her next move. What am I going to do? What folk 
going to say about me? She is now experiencing fear like never before. She's probably thinking about her baby. Although God has spoken, it's still her baby. Although God had overshadowed her, it's still her baby. Even though God still spoke to her, she still had to carry her baby. You won't want to talk to me. A few sisters understand. When God spoke, yes, he did. But the Lord would not stop her natural child birthing pains. When God spoke, yes. But those labor pains belong to her. It's her baby to care for, to love, to cherish, and to nurture. It's her baby whose cry she'll know from day one. It's her baby. She's the one who will have to breastfeed her baby because they ain't got Infamil and Similac or Carnation Pet Milk. No, she will see him crawl, walk, and run as her baby. She will teach him along with Joseph his ABCs and his one, two, threes. She will sit and watch her son become a toddler, learning how to run and fall and get back up on his own. It's her baby. She will watch him learn carpentry from his father or his stepfather, Joseph. She will watch him grow up to learn the Torah, which is the teachings of Moses, the Nevoim, which is the books of the prophets, and the Nephitim, which are writings including the Psalms, and the wisdom, nature, and the literature. It's Joseph and Mary's baby, and guess what? They are in a crisis. Oh, I'm in the Bible. Oh, I'm in the text. Will they succumb to societal pressures? traditions, laws, and customs. Listen, my brothers and sisters, in all their irritation and agitation, God gives some revelation. This is what I'm trying to get to. I needed to set the scene because I didn't want you to think that Mary and Joseph didn't have some issues to deal with. Because if I fast forward this text, and get to the point where Pilate has given, Herod has given out a decree of killing all babies under the three, under three years old. You might be able to understand that. But when we look at the narrative of Mary and Joseph, there are some things going on here that we don't want to talk about. And I thought I'd help you to see that when God shows up, he shows off and then he shows out. God comes to Joseph and inform him, bruh, don't move too fast. God says to Joseph, don't you hide what I'm doing. That's a word for somebody today. Don't let your customs get in the way of what the Lord has spoken over your life. Don't let your traditions interrupt God's eternal plans. Don't let what people say or think delay the destiny that God has over your life. Don't let your plans get in the way of his purpose, says the Lord. God tells Joseph, in essence, take your hands off the controls. This is my doing. That's good news. Because just when we think we figured it all out, God steps in and things are never going to be the same again. I thought I'd talk about this this morning. Because sometimes we move too fast. Sometimes we quit too soon. Sometimes we throw up our hands and throw in the towel and we have forgot that God's timing is not our timing. I want to encourage somebody today not to move too fast, first of all, because you'll find yourself out of alignment with what God has designed for your life. Here is a word for somebody today. Don't step down too soon. If God has not discharged you, don't you quit on God. Don't let your ego stop you from feeling your obligation to God. I didn't say to church. I said to God. Don't jump ship because you're too stubborn to change your energy focus. I ain't getting no amens. I must be getting some ouches. Don't get in God's way of blessing you his way. You and I are not equipped to tell God how to bless us. 
And sometimes you can say, I'm just, I'm just set in my ways. I'm going to get in trouble. But I got to stand if I got to stand by myself. Have you ever thought that just maybe you might be a little too hard headed? A little bit too spoiled? And you've been getting away with what my mother called, you've been getting away with murder. And God has called a pastor to inform you on this last communion Sunday of the year. You might be moving too fast. And here is the thing. Here is the thing. You're moving too fast trying to get out of God's will because you want to have your way. When you're raising children, if you're going to love them, you're going to have to learn how to discipline them. I ain't got no amens because I'm stepping on toes. And, and, and one of the things about love is love make you want to do right when you want to do wrong. 